The Intel Arc A770 seems to be a GPU that has a lot of community interest for gaming, which seems to be kind of hit or miss depending on the piece of software. However, this card makes a much more compelling choice if you plan to do some sort of content creation or really anything other than gaming. Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. This video is going to discuss some non-gaming related use cases for the A770 that I wanted to highlight. Because while this card is capable of gaming, it's a lot more interesting to use for other workloads that I've been experimenting with. With that out of the way, let's dive into some workloads that I've found work pretty well with the A770 16GB. For 3D modeling software, I think you can break it into two main categories. Actual modeling software and then animation software. Some packages like Blender are technically both, but what I mean more is 3D CAD work versus something more akin to the previously mentioned Blender or Maya. Most modern professional CAD software supports the A770 whether it's through dedicated One API code or a fallback OpenCL or OpenGL implementation. This is one of the use cases that have worked almost flawlessly since the cards first came out, which can't really be said for video editing or gaming software. But at the same time, you aren't generally doing things like rendering high fidelity graphics when you're doing CAD work, and you're instead just rendering lots of basically shaded shapes. I have the most experience with Fusion 360, which is an Autodesk product, meaning that most other products from the same company, I'm primarily thinking of Maya, will work pretty well on these cards. Other software that's technically built for modeling, like Blender, can perform similarly to AutoCAD programs when you're doing modeling work, but also runs decently when it comes time to render final scenes and or creating and applying shaders. This card has ray tracing cores, and while I'm not 100% sure it's making use of them when rendering in Blender as I just haven't seen the source code, the A770 and A750 can really power through final renders much quicker than similarly priced new cards from NVIDIA. Keep in mind that the A750 has a similar number of raw FP32 data paths as the RTX 3060, while having a much stronger memory interface. The A770 has even more cores and faster GDDR6, so it will outperform most of the other cards available in this price tier when it comes to these 3D modeling workloads. The other thing that gives the A770 a massive edge is the 16 gigs of onboard memory. While the 4060 and 5060 Ti 16 GB also have a similar quantity of memory, the quality of the memory, referring to the controller width and overall bandwidth, leans heavily in favor of the A770. The 5060 Ti is a more powerful card than the A770 when it comes to computational throughput but it's also much more expensive, almost doubling the raw cost if you're looking to buy a 16GB model. This carves out a nice little niche at this price point for the A770, and while I understand that it might not be the best for gaming, speaking from experience, all of my CAD and modeling work on this card has been butter smooth, with little to no issues once I got all of the drivers installed. Video editing on this card is one of those workloads that initially didn't work exceptionally well when I first got the A750. By the time the Intel Deep Link integration became available on DaVinci Resolve a few months down the line, things had improved dramatically both in terms of timeline and render performance, and also finally being able to utilize the AV1 encode block for final renders. This AV1 stuff is awesome. It allows for either a similar quality video stream at a lower bitrate than H.264, shrinking file sizes, or offers improved visual quality at the same bitrate as H.264. I personally prefer to utilize the higher quality encoding options when rendering my videos. At the end of the day, I'm a pixel peeper and noticeable macro blocking is one of the more noticeable artifacts, as opposed to other traditional real-time rendering issues. I have my previous RTX 3070 review video rendered out on both my 4070 and A770, with a couple of different codecs at different quality presets. I found that both the A770 and 4070 produced a very similar 2.48GB file when rendering with H.264, 
The 4070 produced the file in a little under 8.5 minutes, while the A770 took just under 9 minutes to fully render the same project. Swap over to the AV1 codec on the A770 and suddenly our render times are cut down to well under the 6 minute mark, while the file size has shrunk down to 2.29 gigabytes, which admittedly isn't a massive improvement. However, when we utilize the AV1 encoder and enable the intelligent variable bitrate, it gets the file size down to 2.15 gigabytes, with a similar render time of also well under 6 minutes. I have also found though that shorter videos tend to compress better with AV1. As to why I'm honestly not quite sure, but a typical 1 minute YouTube short consumes around 250 megabytes on my Optane drive when using the H.264 codec. Swap over to AV1, and that file size usually comes in at less than 150 megabytes. I can't explain why this is happening, but the fact that it is is really cool to see, and the efficiency improvements on the storage side of things means that I can fit more footage into a similar space. The AV1 encoder on this card is also pretty quick, much quicker than H.264 is. But I can't help but bring up that the NVIDIA 40 and 50 series and AMD RX 7000 and 9000 series also feature AV1 encode blocks, making this point kind of mute if you're willing to spend a little more to step up to one of those. But for the price of around $260 new, you get more VRAM than other cards, and a slightly more powerful graphics card that's a little more useful than a narrower but faster clocked B570 in this workload. Now this is what I personally have the most experience with on Alchemist, besides gaming and video editing, whether it be the A750 or A770. Programming for these cards has improved a lot in the past two-ish years that I've had one, and what initially started as kind of questionable has blossomed into a very competitive alternative to CUDA. Other channels will be able to provide more specifics when it comes to using these cards for AI-type workloads, because I simply just don't have the expertise to speak on it comfortably, but for 3D graphics acceleration, it actually can achieve a ton of performance if you're utilizing the entire die. Intel, at least from what I've seen on their presentation materials, has really been driving the idea home of not leaving any of the die dark. What this means is you want to design your hardware in a way that allows for all of it to be properly used, whether through parallelism or pipelining. Your chip does both of these under the hood whether you tell it to or not, but by parallelism I more so mean spreading workloads out across multiple cores and then also utilizing all of the compute throughput available within each core. Intel cards seem to be able to parallelize easily across cores, and you can use similar syntax if you're writing software to run across both multiple x86 cores or the GPU's Z vector engines. What you aren't implicitly doing though without giving the computer a bit more code to work with is running across all of the available data paths within the Z vector engine. The card, when looking at telemetry available to programmers, sees itself as a 512 core part even though it has the ability to parallelize to 4096 individual lanes at a time. When you write your code to utilize the 8 lanes within each Z vector engine, or even just 4 if you're doing vertex processing, you can see an incredible speed up in your render times. This isn't even touching the ray tracing cores, or RT units as they're called in the documentation, because the only way to access them currently is through DirectX shaders using intrinsics. But if you're planning to use one of these Intel cards as a giant bake of SIMD FP32 processing cores, then it will fill that niche quite nicely, even if I do agree it takes a bit of finagling to get the most from it. If you're planning on doing work through a dedicated graphics API, I'd strongly suggest checking out Vulkan, as most implementations I've seen on this hardware have been some of the most impressive displays of graphical technology, both in terms of pixel quality and performance. It may take a bit more time to get used to, trust me I'm speaking from experience, this is like eating glass coming from OpenGL, but if you've got experience with Direct3D12, then it's actually pretty similar, though the learning curve of Vulkan is still a bit steeper, and it seems to perform a little better if you know what you're doing. If you're coming from NVIDIA and have a pre-existing CUDA code base that you want to migrate to Intel or Sickle, then there is an available CUDA to Sickle migration tool that translates the code well, but isn't always the most readable in its initial output. It's usable, though I wouldn't put money on it spitting out 100% working stuff all of the time without some minor reworking on your part. 